Hi, everyone. My name is Wences Shaw Cortez, and I'll be presenting work co authored by myself and my colleagues at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory titled Differentiable Predictive Control with Safety Guarantees, a co Control Barrier Function Approach. So, the motivation behind this work is safety, which is basically a, an invariance condition where we want an autonomous system to stay within some area, right? And this is highly relevant for robotics, for automated vehicles, where we have systems with humans where we want to prevent them from colliding or injuring the human or injuring themselves, um, and thus preventing system damage. The nice thing about safety is it can be used for general task specifications that are not just stability, so stay inside some region and otherwise do whatever you want to do, right? Uh, another big focus um, in a lot of the recent work is in learning-based control. So what I mean by learning-based control is usually a neural network encoded controller that is, that's implemented, um, which has been shown empirically to work well, although hard guarantees on safety and or stability are hard to come by. But when they're implemented, they also have a low computational burden, which is advantageous for online implementation. However, the performance of these learning-based controllers are generally dependent on the training set and, of course, on the expert behind the curtain, right? This expert that knows the hyperparameters to choose for this neural network. Um, and if you don't have one or the other or a good export or a good training set, you don't really know what's going to happen uh, as a result of implementing this learning-based control law. So what we want to do is kind of combine both of these. We want to have a learning-based control law with its benefits, but that can also guarantee safety for a lot of real-world scenarios. So how can we go about doing this? If we look into the control setting, a uh, popular method for safety critical control is model predictive control, which is developed a while ago in the 70s, um, which is a form of advanced optimal control, <clears throat> which can handle constraints and optimality in one control law. But the problem, of course, is that it's computationally expensive, which is always a, a hindrance for a lot of um, real world implementation. But MPC, as perhaps many of us know, we solve an optimization problem in the loop, as you can see here on the right. And in this optimization problem, you're gonna minimize some costs. So this could be tracking a reference. And you're gonna have your model as part of the optimization problem because we're going to predict into the future, right? Some over some prediction horizon, how the system will behave. And over that prediction horizon, we're gonna minimize the cost and choose a controller to satisfy our constraints, right? We solve this problem, we implement the first instance of that hor uh, control horizon, and we re resolve the problem and repeat, that's done. So this is nice for general constraint and optimality satisfaction, but it's not that great for its computational uh, burden. So what has been developed at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory is a learning-based equivalent of MPC, which is called differentiable predictive control. So the concept is that we take the MPC formulation and we use it to train basically a neural network that encodes the MPC control law, right? So here on the right, we have this pi term, which is the neural network. The W are the parameters of that neural network. And what we do is incorporate the constraints of the MPC as penalties in the loss function of this DPC um, training optimization. The other difference with MPC is that because DPC is trained offline, we're going to try to take into account a lot of the parameters that might be included in MPC. So this is more of a parametric approach where you consider different references, different initial conditions, different problem parameters, so that when you're online, you can hopefully take into account a wide range of um, system scenarios, right? So this is more of a structured way of training a neural network. It has a theoretical connection with MPC. It's all done offline. It can be applied to time-varying references, but of course, it's still a learning-based method. It doesn't have hard guarantees of safety or constraint satisfaction or uh, robustness to perturbations. And of course, this is also a discrete time implementation as this is training is done offline on a computer. So the whole the overall setup of how you would implement DPC is you have some time series data of your model or of your system, and you use that to develop a model, which could be just a physics-based um, model. It could be a complete black box, which is just a neural network or something in between. You incorporate the model in your optimization problem, 
And what happens is to train the neural network, you'd first do a forward pass for some initialized neural network controller. You then compute the loss function, which includes the performance and the constraints on your system. And in the backward propagation, you use stochastic gradient descent to update the parameters of your neural control law. And you do this repeatedly um, for the wide range of parameters until you've trained your neural system. And so this is the, the main idea, like, right, this is how DPC works. Um, it gives you a structured way of, of learning a controller. So next, what can we do with that? Well, we want to develop hard guarantees on safety, right? And a nice way of doing that is with control barrier functions, which I'll review here. Um, for those that are not familiar with it. So here we'll have a nonlinear affine system, a control nonlinear affine system. We will allow a bounded disturbance. Um, and the goal is that we want to keep our system inside of this set. This is our so super level set of some function H, which is our candidate barrier function. And we want to find a control law such that if we start inside of this set, the system will remain inside of that set, right? So <clears throat> this is the main principle barrier function. Um, it has to satisfy a, this condition, which is that the derivative of H has to be greater than or equal to the negative of alpha of H, where alpha is an extended class K function. Now, without going into too many of the details, this condition is based on what's called Nagamo's theorem. Nagamo's theorem states that if you ha have a set just like this depicted on the right, you start inside of this set, then whenever the system hits the boundary of this set, you will remain inside of the tangent cone. And what that means in terms of our safe set C is that the derivative of H is going to be non-negative whenever you're on the boundary, right? And that is inherently encoded in this condition with alpha acting almost like a slack variable. So if H is sufficiently in, if you're sufficiently inside of your safe set, H is going to be more positive, which allows your derivative of H to be negative. So you can approach your safe set, uh, sorry, the boundary of your safe set. And then once you reach the boundary, H is zero. So you recover your Nagamo's conditions, which means you will stay inside of your safe set, right? That's the main principle. And then to implement a control law, well, you can just accept any nominal control. So this could be, for example, DPC, I presented before, or another learning-based control law. You enforce your input constraints, and you then also enforce your barrier function con uh, condition, right? And here I've included the bound on the disturbance, so you can incorporate robustness to uh, uncertainties. Okay, now if your input constraint is uh, polyhedral, then you have a QP. If not, you have just a nonlinear program of some sort that you need to solve online to enforce safety. Okay, so the idea here was first to combine these two methods together, right? Barrier functions and DPC, kind of like marrying the two, which has been done in the literature. You just incorporate the DPC or learning-based control law into your cost function of your optimization. Um, DPC, as I said before, provides a structured learning methodology, fast online implementation, whereas the barrier functions provide safety and robustness, right? But there are some limitations. It's kind of naive to just put these together um, right off the bat. First off, DPC is a discrete time implementation, as is any digital controller that you implement on a continuous time system. So the safety is only for that we've presented so far is only for continuous time. Also, the optimization problem that we're solving has to be solved at every instant in time, which is counterintuitive to what we wanted DPC for, like learning-based control law, which is its fast implementation. We, what we really want to do is reduce how many optimization problems have to be solved online to enforce the safety. Also, uh, the current setup is for a time invariant sets. We would like to look at time varying sets to be a bit more general. Um, and just combining DPC with this barrier format is, is a bit naive because in the end, the barrier function is going to override DPC if it's ever unsafe. So at the moment, it's a training agnostic to the barrier function where we actually want is to make DPC aware of the fact that the barrier function may override it, right? So these are objectives here, which is we want to extend this to a sample data system. We want to reduce the online optimization as much as possible, um, extend it to time, time varying sets and incorporate training into the DPC, sorry, incorporate the barrier function into the DPC training. Okay, so how are we going to do this? So we're going to modify the barrier functions that I presented before. First off, uh, Nagamo's theorem only requires this condition h dot greater than equal to zero when you're on the boundary of the set. 
So you don't actually need to check this condition for all states inside of, of some region around your safe set. Okay, so the way we can kind of relax this condition is by defining a region around the boundary to check our monogamous condition. And what this is going to let us do is then only address the optimization problem if our controller, our DPC controller, tries to move the system near the boundary of the safe set. Okay, that's that's like kind of the main principle here is how you're going to reduce the online optimization problem. Um, and what that looks like is just as this um, event trigger like condition actually, which we didn't realize beforehand. If you are outside of your A set, so if you're sufficiently inside of your safe set, you just implement DPC as it is. Only if you start getting close to the boundary when you're in A will you have to solve an optimization problem. Okay. So next, we're just going to extend it to a time varying uh, set. Um, this, a lot of it is just bookkeeping, keeping track of time and how it affects the safe set, your the ring around your boundary, uh, and also your control implementation. Um, this picture is just an example of how this could be done. For example, if you wanted it to stay inside of a tube uh, where your safe set changes with time, you take a slice of that and we recover our picture that we had uh, previously. Okay, so we have a time varying implementation with our ring, which is gonna let us reduce the optimization online. And the last thing we wanna do is look at the sample data formulation. So for sample data control, um, we have a zero order hold between sampling times. So our control is gonna be constant from one sampling to the next. And also uh, at the beginning of that sampling, we're gonna get the, the states that we sample, which we're not going to update until the next sampling instance. Okay, so what we need to do is account for intersampling effects. Now there are various ways of doing this in the literature. The approach that we took is to consider the worst case. So you wanna consider the control actions and the dynamics. So the way that this is done is we wanna know how much H dot is going to change from one sample to the next. So what you do is you basically compute H dot, right? You're gonna treat H dot over the entire sampling period. And we're gonna subtract it from H dot evaluated only at the beginning of that sampling time. And what we're gonna do is use these bounds to know what the worst difference, the worst case difference that could happen between these two. And if you look at the analysis in the paper, you'll see that this can come out as a linear function of your sampling time, where this new is kind of like a robust margin. That's a function of your bounds, the Lipschitz constants, and your control limits. Then since you know that H dot can only change by this much between its sampling and the end of the sampling period, you're gonna incorporate that as a robustness margin in the H dot condition of your control law, okay? So then what ends up happening is we get our overall control implementation, which is again, sampled based. So we're gonna check at every sampling instance, first is our state inside of our ring or is it outside of the ring? If it's outside of the ring, we just implement DPC. We never solve an optimization problem. If we are inside of the ring, we then solve our optimization problem, right? We keep take into account the intersampling effects and we allow for a time bearing set. So some observations on this. First, A must be large enough to sample. So you need to have A large enough so that anytime you sample, no matter what, the state will always be inside of your safe set before it reaches the boundary, right? So you have enough time to implement a control law to correct for any unsafe actions. The bound on that is in the paper if anyone's interested. Also, <clears throat> what's nice about this is that if your control law, your learning-based control law, which is with our structured method or DPC approach is trained properly, then you never solve an optimization problem. What I mean by trained properly is if it, if it never takes a system close to the boundary of the safe set, you just implement DPC as it is, right? You don't, you don't need the corrective action of the optimization problem. Otherwise, of course, vary function ensures robustness and continuous time safety. Um, but also there is a nice trade-off Right, because conservatives, there's a conservatism in the barrier function, right? We have this bounds on our on our dynamics with our sampling-based um, robustness bounds, as well upper bounds on our disturbance, which might restrict how we design our barrier functions. Um, but because we're combining it with the empirical performance of DPC, it gives us a nice trade-off of conservatives conservatism, but safety with empirical performance. And for the offline training, what we want to do is basically incorporate barrier function condition in DPC. So it tries not to conflict with the barrier function condition online. 
So we have our bare condition here, h dot greater than two minus alpha of h. And because dbc is in discrete time, we're going to do a finite time, uh, finite difference approximation and incorporate this condition as the constraint in our um, dbc cost function. Now, um, an altern alternative method, which we didn't have at the time of publication, was to use a projection-based implementation, which is literally just incorporating the barrier function control law um, onto the output of your neural network here so that we know during training that the constraints will never be violated. <clears throat> but the results presented here in the paper are for the penalty-based approach. So what results do we have? So we have a simple system here. Um, we have a control input. We have a, a sin, sinusoidal disturbance. The safe set is to stay between these black dash dotted lines. So it's a time varying set and we want to stay close to a reference, which is this dashed red line. We have several conditions. One is when we have the barrier function only. So we see that it reaches close to the boundary. And then this gap that we see between um, the state and the boundary of the set is defined by our A set, our ring. So we see when there's only bare function control implemented, we hear safe. Um, and we try it with DPC, which is poorly trained, which is when it's given a reference that actually does not track this reference. And the resulting DPC controller, of course, violates our condition. Whereas when we incorporate it with the bare function in purple, it tracks exactly the, the DPC control, um, the state that results from that control, and all, but also keeps us outside, um, keeps us in the safe set. And then finally, when we have DPC trained properly on the correct reference, we never implement the optimization problem, right? We stay close to the reference despite the disturbance acting on our system and only implement DPC and never any online correction, right? Mm -hmm. We see a control happening here. One thing I wanted to note is that there are jumps or seeming to be jumps in the control law, even though this is a sample based control, a sample database controller. And the reason is because we chose A to be very small. But if you wanted to avoid that and have a more Lipschitz like behavior, you would make A a bit bigger, um, but which might be better for a lot of systems online. So to summarize, we have a learning-based control law with hard safety guarantees um, in the form of an event-triggered like barrier function condition. Um, and what's nice is that we solve our optimization or possibly QB, um, and which is never enforced if the system is trained well. Um, so next steps, we're gonna look at more general systems, how to synthesize these barriers and look at adaptive methods. Thank you.